Okay, what I'd like to do in this video is give you an overview of the hypothesis testing procedure for the population mean. Um, my hope is that, you know, after you watch this video and then begin your reading in chapters 10 and 11, um, you know, you'll, you'll go into the reading with a real solid understanding of what hypothesis testing is all about. And, you know, and then while you're reading it, you know, it, you'll kind of put uh, all your ducks in a row um, because the, the, pro the process is pretty uh, lengthy. Um, what I've done for all the hypothesis tests that we're going to learn in this course is I've created these templates. So these templates are available in my math lab um, in the templates folder uh, in the, within document sharing. And this, this template here, what it does essentially is it, um, it's, it's kind of a, a, almost like a form where you fill out uh, all the details, but it kind of holds your hand through the hypothesis testing procedure. And I really think it's going to help you organize your thoughts. Um, so what I'm going to do is just, you know, tell you how I think of hypothesis testing. So let's say, um, you know, some uh, person, statistician, whatever, comes along and, and decides to pass judgment on a population parameter. Now remember, there are several parameters that we've studied, um, one of them being the population mean mu, and another one being the population standard deviation sigma, and um, you've also learned the population proportion p. Um, of course, there's the population size, capital N. So, you know, these things like mu, sigma, p, capital N, these things, remember, they're called population parameters. And, um, you know, these things are the numerical descriptions for everybody. And remember, um, getting those is uh, virtually impossible. If not impossible, let's just say it's very difficult, you know, because to ask every person in the population a question so that we can find the population mean is very difficult. And remember what we did in the last section for confidence intervals is we learned how to estimate the population mean and the population proportion. In other words, remember the estimator for mean, uh, the population mean, I'm sorry, is the sample mean, x bar. The estimator for the population standard deviation is S, the sample standard deviation. For P, the population proportion, the estimator is P hat. That's called the sample proportion. And the estimator used for the population size, obviously, is the sample size, lowercase n. Now, these things are called statistics. All right, so we use these statistics to pass judgment on population parameters. So let's say some guy comes along and wants to pass judgment on one of these parameters, all right? So let's say it's, let's use the population mean, that'll be the easiest. So let's say we're studying um, uh, hours spent on um, Snapchat uh, per week. You know, you, you have tons of uh, time, I'm sure that many of you spend on Snapchat each week, um, you know, answering your streaks and, um, you know, checking out all different things that you may do on there. And I don't know how many hours that is. You know, if I know I know the stats for Facebook. Um, it's been around seven, seven and a half hours per month. Um, I'll take a guess. It's around the same. Let's say there's a claim. And this guy comes along and says, listen, I know the population mean. Um, the population mean time uh, spent... on Snapchat is, let's say, seven hours per month. All right, so think about that. In other words, the population mean, the symbol we use for that, that's mu, right? So we say would, this claim would be mu equals seven hours, you know, symbolically. All right, now, obviously, that's a bold claim because you might be, you know, thinking, well, you know, that guy that's making that claim, he didn't ask me that question. And, you know, I spend uh, maybe only three hours a month on Snapchat. Um, you know, is it, how does he know that my response of three hours is, you know, within his, um, you know, average that he's claiming? Well, obviously, he's used some technique to estimate that average. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen those techniques in the last section with confidence intervals. But, you know, if you're, let, let's say you're, you're a new and upcoming statistician and, you know, you're, you're disagreeing with this claim in some way. And you want to oppose it. You know, maybe, um, you know, if you want to disagree with this guy, 
uh, maybe you feel that the that Snapchat is you know being uh, more popular than ever, and you're like, no way, is it seven hours? It's got to be more than that. So you you might oppose this claim. So I'll call this the opposing claim. And I'll write this symbolically, so I don't have to write out all the words. But if you're going to oppose, you know, the claim that the mean, the population mean, is seven hours, then you know the opposing claim for that, you might feel that you know Snapchat is more popular than ever. So you might say, you know what, no way, the population mean time spent uh, has to be greater than seven hours. That would be one way to pass judgment against the guy claiming it's seven hours. Now, maybe you um, you believe maybe Snapchat is losing popularity and maybe uh, people aren't spending as much time on it. Uh, you might maybe feel it's less than seven hours. So that's another way you could um, oppose this claim. And finally, a third way you could oppose this claim is, you know, what if you don't want to pass judgment on a direction? If you don't want to say it's bigger or less, what if you just want to say it's different than seven hours? So we'll say not equals to seven hours. So notice, for the, for the one way you could state an equality, there are three ways we could state an inequality. Three ways to oppose this claim. All right, fine. So now if you're this guy, and let's, let's, let's pick um, a scenario to make life easy for us. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the scenario where you just want to say it's different than seven hours. Let's say that's the one we're talking about right now. Now, if you're wondering how would I know which one of these three it's going to be when I start working these questions, that'll be very obvious to you or mostly obvious when you're reading these problems, the, the language in the question eludes to which one of these uh, three opposing claims it's going to be. Um, but let's say you're the guy that comes along and say, you know what, it's not seven hours, it's something different. Um, obviously, if you're that statistician, um, you're going to have to back yourself up. So you're going to say, well, you know, um, all right, fine, I'm going to have to go into the real world right now, and I'm going to have to devise some plan on how I'm going to sample from the population um, you know, of Snapchat users, so I could, you know, prove to uh, this, you know, guy that's stating the original claim that he says the answer is seven. I think it's, um, you know, significantly different than seven. Uh, I'm going to have to run out there and grab some data. All right, so say you run out in the real world and you grab your data. So you devise a plan to sample. A plan, now remember, a sampling plan um, has to grab data, number one, that targets the audience that you want. In other words, Snapchat users, right? And maybe you're going to be interested in a certain demographic region, um, a certain um, age group of people, genders, uh, ethnic group, who knows. Whatever you decide um, your target audience is going to be for this particular study, you have to devise a plan that would run out there, sample these people in a fair, unbiased fashion. All right, so let's say you do that. And let's say we grab some data. You know, we grab um, a sample of like, let's say 300 pieces of data. We could totally pull that off probably in a, a couple weeks, no problem. Um, and then obviously those 300 pieces of data uh, are gonna give me a sample mean. Now, what is a sample mean? I have no idea. You know, uh, we, could, we could start looking up um, Snapchat statistics on Facebook, if, on, on, a, on Google if we'd like, and, um, you know, check out what, the, what people are doing nowadays. But who knows what that number is? And, you know, honestly, the number is irrelevant. It doesn't even matter. Um, you know, for all practical purposes, let's make one up. Who knows what that is? You know, let's say it's um, 6.5 hours. Who knows? And again, I don't know this number. And the, the value we put there is really kind of irrelevant. Now, obviously, if you have 300 pieces of data and you can calculate a sample mean from that thing, um, obviously, you'd, you'd be interested in the standard deviation as well. Now, of course, you know the game, how the game works with confidence intervals and the standard deviation. You know, what kind of standard deviation do I have? Do I have the population standard deviation, sigma? Or um, do I not have the population standard deviation? And am I going to use these 300 pieces of data to, to crunch the standard deviation of the sample? And remember, depending on what you're given, the population standard deviation or the sample standard deviation leads you to what distribution you're going to use. So remember, if, you're, if you know the value of the population standard deviation, you know, then you're going to use the, um, the uh, normal distribution and z-scores. If you know the sample standard deviation, because the population standard deviation is unknown, then you're going to use the t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right, so let's say for this scenario, let's pretend somehow, some way, 
we know the population standard deviation. All right, so now think about it. There is a number that you know that relates all this information. In other words, these things here. If you think about it, the population mean, the sample size, x bar, and let's pretend again that we know sigma. You know a statistic that relates all those things, and that statistic is called the z-score. Now, under the central limit theorem, remember the z-score, it's x bar minus mu x bar, but remember the mean of the sampling distribution, mu x bar and mu are the same, so I'll just write mu there. And you divide by what we call the standard error, which is sigma over radical n. Now, the st the, so again, what, re what relates the population mean and n x bar and sigma? Well, that's things called the, the z-score formula. Now, think about this. The central limit theorem tells me that this z-score, now on the bell curve, you have zero in the middle, standard deviation of one. So here's the standard normal distribution. Now, you know, where is this thing going to live? You know, what is this number equal, in other words, this z-score? And you think about what the z-score is doing. Think about what's happening here. It's comparing your sample mean to what this original guy is claiming. He's claiming it's 7. What's this sample mean? I put 6.5 there, but again, I don't know what that number is. So it, it compares. It finds how far apart these two things are, divides by the standard error, converts that to a z. Now, the central limit theorem says, you know, this z-score, it's going to land at a very close proximity to center. All right, that's where we think it's going to land. You know, honestly, if you, you reach into a uh, distribution that has a known mean and you grab a whole bunch of samples, the central limit theorem says when you find the average of those samples, it's going to land near the middle. So that z-score lands on the standard normal distribution. The only problem is we've got these other z-scores. Z-scores that, as you know, cut areas under the normal distribution. So... Those z-scores are called critical z-scores. Remember, we write them as z sub c's, critical z's. And they're critical because they separate regions under the bell curve that you know, is likely to land in versus regions that are unlikely to land in. So let's give a confidence. Let's, let's put some confidence in the middle here. I'll put, I'll put point, um, 0.95 in the middle here. So if that's 95% in the confidence region, then obviously uh, alpha, the level of significance, is 5%. And if you take that alpha and split it equally between these two tails, this will be alpha divided by 2. That'll be 0 0.025. Alpha over 2, 0 0.025. Now I'm just using 95% as an arbitrary um, uh, confidence level. So think about what these critical z-scores would be. All right, so I, we have these. So I have this in this handout here. Remember, this is the what distribution do I use handout <clears throat> that's in my math lab. I think it's in week 10 or 9, I forget. You have to check that out. Um, but, you know, there's these um, critical values, you know, the critical z-scores based on one and two tails, and you've seen this already. So if you look over here for 95% confidence, two tails, positive and negative 1.96. So remember what those do. So this is 1.96 and negative 1.96. These are z-scores that cut areas under the bell curve. 